Good morning, beautiful people. Glad to see you all here. Let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord in prayer. Lord, we're coming here um, to declare your goodness, to proclaim your mercy, to proclaim your faithfulness in song. We're doing with the understanding that you gave us the day you save us and the understanding we have about your word that says that you are mighty to save, that you are merciful, that you are our father. But also we don't want to forget that you are king, king of kings, that you are righteous, that you are good, that you are sovereign. So we want to exalt who you are right now, Lord, in this time of worship. Work in our hearts, Lord. Transform us right now, Lord, and prepare us to listen to your word and be glorified among us, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Let's worship the Lord. The Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand, with a mighty hand, and now stretch out. His love endures forever For the life that's been reborn His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Forever Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever, God is faithful. 
You're faithful, Lord. We bless your name. problems. There's just some problems only God can fix. All of my trials were me down to this. I see it happen time and time again. There's just some problems. some battles. There's just some battles flesh and blood can win. There'll be some moments that's just no sense. You can't see it now, but I'm still convinced. There's just some problems only God can fix. Not by power.
fortress, my refuge, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more than the love come close. No thing can compare. You are living more. Your presence.
heaven we gather the name of Christ this morning to be worshipers to praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ praise the Father praise the Son praise the Spirit three in one we worship you this morning God we ask you to be glorified in all that we think say and do continue to lead us in this service and Lord Jesus according to your promise dwell with your people may we sense your presence may you impart your power to us and give to us that which we have desperate need of today a deeper walk with Christ. Be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Take a minute to greet one another. Fifth through eighth grade is dismissed to the Sunday school class. Good morning, everyone. You might need to scoot, you might need to scoot down one. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Great to be with you this morning. Um, just, uh, just great to be with you. I was, I was glad when they said to me, let's, let's go to the house of the Lord. It's great to be worshiping with you this morning. Uh, if you're a first-time guest with us, we have a gift we want to give to you. It's a coffee cup, a uh, travel mug. They're up in our coffee house. We'll give you that with a free pastry. Say thanks for being with us. Uh, enjoy worshiping with you this morning. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, if you have a cell phone, we ask you to put it on vibrator, turn it off so we're not disturbed by your ringtone during our service. Uh, we don't normally pass a plate to receive an offering, but we have an offering box at the back of the sanctuary. Why don't you leave the building to receive your tithes and offerings? A couple announcements. Uh, let's see, uh, Calvary Chapel Choir, Ron, will be leading our choir. They'll be meeting after the service. If you're interested, it's not a lifetime commitment. Uh, we're not expecting you to sign over uh, the title to your home to participate today. But if, if you want to just see if that's something you'd like to do, Ron would love to, uh, to give you the information uh, to help you make that decision. That'll be after service today here in the sanctuary. Uh, let's see, um, uh, next Sunday is it's Labor Day weekend next week, correct? Uh, next week, we only have one service, the 1045 service, so uh, make a note of that so you don't come to the wrong, uh, you don't try to come to the first service and end up like, where is everybody? And then the following week, so that's September 3rd, and the following week, September 10th, there's a little uh, uh, ticket on your seat, admit one, you don't have to have this to get into the park, but um, if you, uh, on September 10th, we'll be meeting at the Claytown Park on Wetzel Road, we're going to have a picnic and uh, we'll have service outside with music and a short message, and then we'll just hang out together. That's uh, September 10th, so make a note of that. And let's see. Um, we did, the elders made, it, uh, made some decisions this past week to try to meet some of the needs of our young families with young children. So we instituted three changes. One of the things we did was we expanded the rows a little bit, so there's a little more room, especially for people like me who need a little more room. So the rows are a little farther apart. They, were, they met the standard, but we moved them out another six inches, believe it or not. And you still might feel a little crowded, but we did expand the distance between the rows. We set up the last row uh, for uh, young families with young children. Uh, we, I've seen some uh, ladies come in with the little ones and trying to find their family and come in with a stroller, coming halfway down the aisle. We want that last row there to be reserved for young families with young children. And we also made the family room, which is behind the mirrorized window. It's been kind of uh, functioning as an overflow room. That's not the intention of that room. That's a room for, for young families with young children. It's not a place that you can come late, bring your breakfast, and have you know McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts while you watch the service. So just make a note of that. We're, we're trying to do what we can to minister to young families. We have a lot of young babies, a lot of young families in our church now. 
We want to make sure that they don't feel left out, so we're doing that. See? <laughs> you may not know this, but I had a button to push to make... <laughs> That's how much young families mean to us. I want to introduce a couple of uh, lovely ladies this morning to come and give us a special announcement. Lucy and Renee, please come. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> I get embarrassed almost every Sunday morning by him. <laughs> uh, so, ladies, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> they think they think I'm going to preach now and talk about you. <laughs> so, we're, ladies, we're here to um, give you some information about the upcoming Bible study, and we're going to show the promo video for you before. Five minutes before you see Jesus, what will you wish you had done differently? Would you live your life so that you have as few regrets as is possible at that moment? In fact, at that moment, nothing else will matter, will it? Isaiah chapter 6 said he looked up at a very difficult time in his life. It was when King Uzziah died, but at that moment, he saw the Lord. And as our world unravels, and we're living at very difficult moments and days and weeks and years, and perhaps things get even more difficult, I believe it's imperative that you and I look up, because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And I believe he's coming soon. And how do you and I respond to such tremendous news and such overwhelming hope? We're to live our lives by watching. We can't know the day or the hour, and you watch out for people who will try to predict the day or the hour, but listen to it. We can know the generation. Jesus has given us the sign so that we can know the generation that's the last one before he returns. So watch and work. The fields are white and the harvest and the laborers are few. Ask God to give you an assignment. And we know we're to live for his glory and we're to demonstrate what Jesus would be like in whatever position he's placed us, but is there somebody that you need to share the gospel with? Would you cross the street? Would you go next door? Would you go to the cubicle where you work and, and tell other people about Jesus, that God loves them, that he has a plan and purpose for their lives, and that they can come into a personal, permanent love relationship with him when they come to him through faith in Jesus Christ? They can have real hope for the future. Good morning, ladies. I'm Lucy Lang, and here with me today is Renee France. And um, we are here to invite you to a nine-week video group study with Anne Graham Lotz. And as you probably know, that's Billy Graham's daughter. She's a wonderful speaker, and she the study is expecting to see <clears throat> excuse me expecting to see Jesus. Uh, in her video, she's a, accompanied by uh, Dr. Crawford Loritz and Dr. Henry Blackaby. And in the videos, there's discussion between the three of them, and they talk about different characters in the Bible, how God revived them and using them an example for our lives, and that's what we're going to learn from. And in the second video, there's a workshop that um, Anne does, and she teaches us how she studies the Bible, and she does the three-question method. Uh, what does God's word say? What, God, what does God's word mean? And what does God's word mean to me? And this is incorporated in all of our workbooks, and I just want to let you know, ladies know there's not a ton of homework, in case you were wondering. So um, I just wanted to let you know that I enjoyed having uh, Renee in our past Bible studies. She's just been an inspiration to me. She's just so excited to learn and She's so eager, and she's made wonderful relationships. And um, just all the, the ladies in our study, study, they're just all so different and so beautiful. So I just wanted to invite you. So Renee has a few things to share with you. Oh, thanks. Good morning, everybody. So I have been so blessed by just being able to be here. I've grown in my walk with the Lord by doing the studies and attending church here. Um, before I started attending here, I knew about God. Now I know God. I can truly say that. I know he has a plan and a purpose for me, and I know he has a plan and a purpose for all of you, because I know that, because Jeremiah 29, 11 says so. <laughs> so, 
word of God is true. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so I'd like to invite all of you to ladies to come join us on September 12th, starting at 7 o'clock to 8.30. We're going to meet right here at Calgary Syracuse. You can sign up at the registration table today or next Sunday. You're going to order your book. You're going to want to do that ASAP because it may take a little bit to get here. Um, so when you come to class, I want you to come with a heart expecting to see Jesus. Thanks. We have some special guests with us this morning. I'm going to invite Aaron and Allie to come up with their two little ones. They want to dedicate them to the Lord Jesus this morning. Let's welcome them, shall we? It's great to have you here with us this morning. You know, the Bible says that children are a blessing from the Lord. They're the heritage of God that he's given to us. And Aaron and Allie wanted to dedicate their little ones to Christ this morning. Our church doesn't believe in baby baptism. Some churches, some Protestant churches, practice uh, baby baptism, a christening, uh, symbolic of uh, the, uh, being in, inducted into the covenant uh, like circumcision was in the Old Testament. Uh, we don't believe that. We believe in uh, believer's baptism, but we do believe in dedicating our children to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me here. There we go. Because children, children belong to God and are given by grace to, as gifts to parents, it's proper and appropriate for us to dedicate them back to God. Amen. God blessed Hannah with a son named Samuel. And she says in 1 Samuel 1, Therefore I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He is lent to the Lord. Mary and Joseph presented Jesus and dedicated him in the temple. And when the time came for the purification according to the law, they brought him up to Jerusalem, that him as Jesus, to present him to the Lord. In the same way, Aaron and Allie are presenting their little ones, Noel and Ivy, to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Aaron and Allie are presenting Noel and Ivy to dedicate them to Christ. Are you presenting them, I should say, are you presenting them this morning to dedicate them to Christ? Signified by saying we are. You're making a covenant with Christ to raise them to the Lord, as Moses said. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And keep these commandments I give you today. Write them upon your hearts and press them, on, and press them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. You agree to raise Noel and Ivy to know Christ so that when they are of age, they can make a decision to follow him. If that's your decision, signify by saying amen. amen. Congregation, it's our part. Aaron and Allie are dedicating them publicly, Noel and Ivy. We are privileged to witness their faith as they ask God to bless them. In addition, they're asking us, their church, to stand with them, to help them, when necessary, to raise them to know Christ. Congregation, do you agree to support Aaron and Allie with support, prayer, counsel, as they seek to raise Noel and Ivy in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do, signify by saying amen. amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this lovely family. We thank you for the gifts that you've given to them with Noel and Ivy. We ask for Aaron and Allie, Lord, wisdom, patience. We ask for love, for support, for kindness, for compassion with these little ones. And all that you bless them with, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would guide them and direct them in every step. As they, as they walk by the way, as they lay down and get up, as they sit at the table, may they talk about you and your love for them. We, we dedicate them to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. We ask, O oh Lord, they would, would grow to know you and to serve you all the days of their life. Bless this home, bless this family, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, honey. Side hug. Let's show our affirmation, shall we? We only have a couple hours left to go. 
I'm going to try to truncate uh, the message this morning because time has gotten away from us. So bear with me. Just so you know, Allie, that last row is for parents with young children. <laughs> when you think of the term radical, what do you think of? Maybe you think of an uh, Islamic terrorist with an AK-47 with bands of bullets sitting on a horse, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, ready to rid the world of non-believers. Possibly you think of an Antifa protester in Portland throwing a Molotov cocktail into a police station. Maybe less threatening, you think of uh, a sports individual, a person who has a favorite team, who's a, as a fanatic, he's radical for his team, and uh, you know, has all the, the paraphernalia, he paints his face on Saturday or Sunday, with, depending if it's college or pro football. Uh, he goes to the games, he has season tickets, he tailgates with all of his friends, and expends a, a great deal of resources, financial and time, to participate in the activities associated with his favorite team. Radical, by, according to dictionary.com, means a person who holds strong convictions or extreme principles. He's a, an extreme radical, extreme right-wing radical, they like to say now. That's, by the way, that's code for a person who's in the middle. They call him an extreme right-wing radical. It, it's often used in a negative sense, pejorative. Listen to what President James Garfield said. I'm trying to do two things. I'm daring to be a radical and not a fool. And that proves to be very difficult. To be radical, but yet not to be a fool and discount your beliefs because you're committed to what you're committed to. Daring to be radical. How can someone be so committed but not committed that they go off the deep end? The radical Christian life, they say, begins where our comfort zone ends. We as Christians, would you agree with me? We like to live in a comfort zone. We want to be comfortable. I like my lazy boy recliner. We like to be comfortable, but the radical Christian life ends or begins where our comfort zone ends. And God wants to get us out of our comfort zone. They say the job of the pastor is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. My question for you this morning is, are you comfortable? Because I think God's challenging us to go the extra mile, to, uh, to engage Christ in a level deeper than that we're used to. When you think of Christian radicals, what do you think of? I tend to think of, when I think of a Christian radical, a person in a sandwich sign on the street corner screaming at passerbys to repent. And as the people walk by, they shake their heads and say, what, a, what an idiot. He's a radical. We tend to think that way, that it's some bizarre individual on the street corner. But just know this, Jesus was a radical. Yet he drew people to him. He was radically committed to the things of his father. This is all that he's commanded me I've done. Father, I've done everything you said. Matter of fact, when he was baptized, what were the words coming up out of the water? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, right? Jesus was a radical. John the Baptist was a radical. I felt God calling me to be more like John the Baptist, that is to have that courage to look at individuals and say, you know, it's time to repent. There he is right there. That's Jesus. Point to Christ and say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. My question for you this morning as we think about our text, we're continuing our study of 2 Samuel. We're in chapter 6 where David brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And there's a couple of things that happen. One that displays radical obedience, and the other is radical worship. And the question emerges as I thought about the text. As I thought about the text, this question emerged in my mind. Is it possible to be too radical for Jesus? Is it possible to be too radical for Jesus? If you have your Bible handy, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 6. And we're going to pick up in verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. And I'm kind of going to do a, a, a flyover. It's, it's, it's a long chapter. I, I, I want to kind of do a flyover just to give you the highlights of a couple of things happening. 
What's happening in this chapter is David decides to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, and then there's a problem. And he eventually, because of radical obedience, is able to bring it to Jerusalem, and he participates in what I call radical worship. And his wife, Michael, has a problem with that. David gathered, verse 1, all the men of Israel together. He wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. Verse 3 they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of, Ab of Abinadab. Now, it had been in the house of Abinadab for over 20 years. After the battle of Aphek in 1 Samuel chapter 4, the Philistines took the ark, and they were tormented by having it there. And so they decided to put it on a cart and send it back to, towards the Israelis. And if the, if the oxen, without a driver, went the right way, they knew that God was involved, and that's exactly what happened. The ark came back to Israel, and they took the ark, and they put it into the house of Abinadab, who was a Levite, and it stayed there for over 20 years. Now that David's the king, he wants the ark in Jerusalem where he's at, in the city of David. So what does David do? David does exactly what the Philistines did, puts the ark on a cart and starts to drive it with the two sons of Abinadab, um, Uzzah and Ahio, it tells us. Verse 5, And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and musical instruments. Imagine the joy that they were experiencing as they were coming to Jerusalem with the Ark of the Covenant. All that was happening. It tells us in verse 6, When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah, now he's a Levite. The Levites were supposed to carry the, the instruments. The, the articles of furniture, it's on a cart. He's there with his brother. His father's helping go. And the, the oxen stumble, and Uzzah puts out his hand to steady the ark. He wanted to help God steady the ark. It tells us in verse 6, he put his hand out to the ark of God and took hold of it because the oxen had stumbled. And then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. Numbers 4.15 tells us that the sons of Kohath, and that's what Uzzah is of, the sons of Kohath, of you know, the Levites, they were supposed to carry the ark with poles. And they were supposed to carry it like this, but th they put it on a cart, and when the, the oxen stumbled, Uzzah put his hand to steady it. It tells us that they're not to touch it lest they die. And that's exactly what happened to Uzzah. And unfortunately, beloved, David, listen, David was doing a good thing. The good thing was David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He was doing a good thing, but he was doing it in the wrong way. And it cost Uzzah his life. He put his hand to help God out, and it got him in trouble. That happens to me sometimes with Lucy. I put my hand out to help her, and I, I just get in trouble. That's what happened to Uzzah. He put his hand to, to steady the Ark, and it cost him his life. He did a, a right thing in the wrong way. And sometimes, would you agree with me? As churches, we try to incorporate, as David was incorporating what the Philistines had done with what he was doing, we try to incorporate some of the practices of the world in what we do in church. And God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to do the right thing in the right way. And that's what happens here. Go down to... Um, Verse 12, it, was to, it says, It was told King David that the Lord had blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belonged to him because of the ark of God. So David wanted to bring the ark up. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Verse 13, And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed ox and fed an animal. And so now he's, he's done some Bible study, and he's read what Moses said about how they're supposed to carry the ark. Now he's doing a, the right thing in the right way as he brings the ark to Jerusalem. And it tells us, first, verse 14, And David danced before the Lord with all of his might. Hear me clearly. This is scriptural evidence that David was not a Baptist. David danced before the Lord with all of his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. Now, 
Some think that he was wearing underwear. No, that was just an inner garment. It was an, it was an undergarment, but not like underwear that we think in our, in, our, in our culture. So David, with all of his house, brought up the ark. And he sacrificed, and there, were, there was rejoicing. Notice what happens, verse 16, with David and Michael. David not only had radical obedience, he wanted to obey God specifically in what he commanded, but he also had radical worship. Verse 16, as the ark of the Lord came to the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, his wife, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And when David brought the ark up, he, remember they were sacrificed, every six steps that the priests went, they sacrificed an animal, a burnt offering and a peace offering, and what that meant was the burnt offerings were completely consumed. The peace offerings, the way they did the peace offering is part of it went on the altar, part of it went to the priest's family, and part of it went to the family of the offerer. So there was this big barbecue that was going to happen. So David dances before the ark. He's rejoicing. They're offering these sacrifices. And everybody who participated in that went home with some meat, with a cake of raisins and some bread. There was great joy. But his wife looked out the window and said, oh my gosh, look what my husband's doing. He's embarrassing me in front of everybody. The way he's, he, he's so exuberant. He's off the hooks, as they say. He's radically worshiping in a way that made her uncomfortable. And there's a consequence for that. It tells us at the end of the chapter that Michael never had any children. But David wasn't going to let that stop him from radically obeying what God had called him to do and radically, radically worshiping God, not concerned about what other people around him might think. We tend to be very conscious of people around us. And yet God is calling us, beloved, to step out of the comfort zone. You know, God wants us to get to be radical means we get to the end of the comfort zone and we, we go into an area that where we're not too comfortable. He wants to change us. He wants to make us more like Christ. Is it possible to be too radical for Jesus? You know, when I became a Christian as an 18-year-old kid, one of my brothers took me aside. He was concerned. He was worried. He said, hey, Ken, um, I'm just a little concerned that you don't go off the deep end. I mean, it's okay to go to church. I mean, it's even okay to read the Bible from time to time. But don't, don't get weird. Don't go too far. Don't give him too much money. I mean, he was, I think he was sincerely concerned about me. But, you know, I'm thinking, I want to live for Christ. I want to, back then they called you a, a Jesus freak. I wanted to be a Jesus freak. I wanted to be radical for Christ because Christ was, we sang about it this morning, he was radical for us. Think about it. The things that he endured on, on, on our behalf just blow my mind that he was willing to do that. And he, you know, Judas betrayed him, right? Going a little off script here. Peter denied him. We focus on those two, but when it says that Peter denied him, it said also did the others. All of his disciples fled. If that was me, I would say, you know, these guys are a bunch of losers. I'm not going to do this. I'm done with these guys. Yet he didn't do that. He embraced the cross on our behalf. He became radical for us, and I think he's challenging us to be radical for him, to go the extra mile, as it were. Is it, is it possible to be too radical for Christ? Jim Elliott didn't think so. He was a missionary to South America to an indigenous tribe. Listen to what it says. He said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And let's face it, beloved, all the stuff that we have that God has entrusted to us, our home, our car, our, our furniture, our, our things, all the stuff that's in our homes, our apartments, wherever, we have all this stuff. You're not going to keep one stitch of it. I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Have you? Everything gets turned over. The other day I was sitting in my uh, living room and I was looking at this beautiful piece of furniture my father made with his own two hands. It's called a halter. It's a beautiful piece of furniture. 
My mother, before she passed away, she would have many conversations with me. With me. She was concerned about her treasures. And she said, McKenny, please, please promise me you'll take care of my treasures. Mom, I promise you. It's in my, li it's in my living room. And I'm looking at it. But a thought crossed my mind, I can't look after it forever. Someday we're going to pass from this life, and that halter is going to go somewhere else. And I fear one day it'll end up in a garage sale, or maybe on a, a burn pile, or in a landfill. Because all of our stuff, as Johnny Cash says in that song, Hurt, uh, you can have my pile of dirt. It all goes away. We don't, we don't really keep it. That's why Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'm convinced, beloved, when we get to heaven, we're going to realize we should have invested more. Remember uh, the end of Schindler's List when Oscar Schindler, Liam Neeson's there, and, and, it, and, and before it turns to the color, he's, he pulls the pen off and says, I, I could have saved two Jews with this. He pulls off his watch. I could have saved you know, five Jews with this. And he's, he's realizing all the things he could have done more. I'm convinced when we get to heaven, beloved, we're going to be convinced that, gosh, I could have done more. Why, why was I so afraid to be radical for Christ? Why was I so afraid of radical obedience? Why was I so afraid of radical worship? Why did I, why did I worry about what my neighbors thought? Why did I worry about what other people think around me? I, one time I'm driving down 57, I get to the light at uh, John Glenn Boulevard, and this is before Bluetooth with our phones and the, the earpieces and all that. I, I was just singing in my car. I'm, I'm like this, and I open my eyes. I look at my, the, the person next to me. I'm in the left turn lane. And they're like looking at me like, what's going on over? He's by himself. What's going on over there? I smiled and waved and went back to what I was doing. Radical for Christ. Is it possible to be too radical? Listen to some of the texts where Jesus talks about what it means to be radical for him. I think of that text from Psalm, excuse me, Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? All of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In how much of your ways? In all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Mark 8, chapter, chapter 8, verses 34 and 35 puts it this way. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. A cross was a, a symbol of death. In other words, I'm no longer living just for self. I want to live for other people. I want to live for Christ. And I want to be there for other people. I don't need this. Here, you take it. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my, loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Romans 12, 1 and 2. You know that text. I you know, Old King James, a lot of my memory work is in Old King James. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or your spiritual act of worship. And don't be conformed to the world. The world wants to push us into their mold. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by God's word, that you might prove by experience that his will is good, perfect, and acceptable. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. This is what Paul the Apostle said. He had everything. But whatsoever was gained, I counted loss for the sake of Christ. I want to be, like Paul, radical for Christ. I want us as a church to be radical for Christ. Radical, beloved, in our obedience, but also radical in our worship. That we are, we are adoring Christ for who he is. So there's some things I'm not asking you to do. I'm not asking you to be like the sons of Phineas, because we tend to think of religious radicals that it bothers us. They're off the deep end, they're foolish, they're idiots, they're, they're doing crazy things. The sons of Phineas is a radical Christian, I don't like to call them Christian, but that's what they are, radical Christian group that tries to use violence to ch bring change to their community or in politics. I'm not asking us to do that. I don't want us to be like the sons of Phineas. I don't want us to be a legalistic organization that tries to stipulate that everybody has to look the same. I'm thankful that everybody here this morning looks different. You're probably thankful that you look different than me, right? <laughs> <clears throat> that God hasn't specified you have these requirements. You can't play cards. 
You can't go to movies. You can't, uh, you can't dance. Lucy, um, sometimes she influences me in bad ways. <laughs> she wanted to uh, start taking ballroom dancing lessons. And so we did. And I'm thinking, Lord, the woman you gave me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> she gave me to eat and I did eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil kind of thing. It became a date night for us. We had a great time. There's nothing wrong with a couple engaging in, you know, ballroom dancing. We, we really enjoyed it. Or the clothes you wear. There's a certain uniform for the Christian. Women wear certain kind of clothes. Men wear different kinds. I'm not talking about cross-dressing. That's a whole other topic. But, you know, you can be comfortable. Not, you know, over the top or, you know, demonstrative in your figure. But, you know, God, he doesn't... He's not care. We don't care about the outside. We care about the inside. When God changes the inside, beloved, He changes the outside too. He brings us change. Jesus changes us from the inside out. We don't have to try to push people into a mold. That's not what I'm talking about. Being radical for Christ. I want us to be radical for Jesus. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, first is radical obedience. I want to encourage you this week to read over 2 Samuel chapter 6 again and look at David's incomplete obedience, which, by the way, is disobedience, and then his radical obedience. And then watch him with his radical worship, what he was willing to do in spite of what other people might think. I want us to begin to experience a deeper walk with Christ by radical obedience, being willing to put into practice his word. David wanted to do the good thing in the wrong way. There's disastrous consequences. But it's really not that complicated, is it? If God is God, he has the right to stipulate how we live our lives. Would you agree with me? Amen? He has the right to stipulate how we live our lives, how we order our relationships, how we work on the job, what we do in our spare time, what we put our hand to. And remember, uh, Pastor John Corson taught me this years ago, it's stuck in my brain. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. And we tend to think, oh, oh sin is some, some fun thing that God wants to keep me from. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. Sin doesn't take on this character of being bad because God doesn't want us to, you know, somehow not enjoy something in our lives. Sin is not for bad because it's forbidden. He knows it will hurt us, so he forbids it. It's forbidden because it's bad. It brings destruction. Why does God say, don't commit adultery? Because adultery destroys a, a marriage, destroys a family, destroys a community. That's why God forbids that sin. Why does he forbid murder? Well, he says, do not murder. Because murder is destructive not only to the person who's murdered, but also to the murderer. It mars his soul. And it destroys the community. If you ever watch, um, forgive me, uh, I mentioned this several times. I like to watch crime TV. You watch true crime and how they solve a murder case and that kind of thing. And whenever they interview the family, after someone's been murdered and the case is resolved, the person goes to prison for life or executed or whatever, it's not uncommon to hear that person destroyed our lives. Not only is murder that way, beloved, but hatred's that way too. Unforgiveness is that way as well. Unforgiveness poisons the well. That's why it's forbidden. And you can go down the last five of the commandments. Don't murder, don't hate, don't, don't be unforgiving. Don't commit adultery. Don't participate in sexual immorality, which mars our soul. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're marring the temple when you join yourself to another individual who's not your spouse. He says, don't steal. Don't take things from other people that don't belong to you. And that can be a character, by the way, where he says, don't, don't bear false witness. When you gossip and malign another individual, you're not only destroying that person, you're destroying yourself in, in hurting the community. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. Radical obedience takes us from a place of disobedience and the curse to obedience and a blessing. That's why James says, don't be hearers only, but be doers of the word. 
because then you'll be blessed in your deed. And it's not that you're earning God's blessing, but you put yourself in the path of blessing as you obey God's word, and you put it into practice. Radical obedience. I can't do that. Why not? Because God tells me not to do that. Really? You see, thinking, oh, that's the way you're going to go? I love the story. Pastor Steve and I were talking about it this past week. In Jeremiah chapter 42, 43. After Jerusalem had been destroyed, the Babylonians had taken them captive. Jeremiah was in the land with some of the, of the, of the people that were still there. And the people look at Jeremiah and they go, Jeremiah, pray to the Lord, go to the Lord, find out what he want us, wants us to do, and we'll do it. And Jeremiah says, you got it, I'll do just that. So Jeremiah goes to the Lord and says, Lord, you know, direct us, show us what you want us to do. And in, in a nutshell, the Lord tells Jeremiah, tell the people to stay in the land to not go to Egypt. Got it, Lord, I'll tell them. He comes back to the people, people say, so Jeremiah, what did he say? And I'll tell you what he said. And he comes back and tells them, the Lord tells you to stay in the land and don't go to Egypt. And they looked at Jeremiah and they said, we ain't doing that. They had direct revelation from God. God told them what to do. And they looked at Jeremiah and said, no, nope, not doing that. That's radical disobedience. Especially, beloved, when God gives us direct revelation in his word, how he wants us to live. And we look him in the face and go, you know, I ain't doing that. That's too much. You're asking me to go over the line. Radical obedience for Christ brings blessing, brings direction. And then radical worship. What is worship anyway? Worship is an old English word, worth scribe. It means to ascribe worth to something. When you worship something, you're declaring that it's valuable. You're ascribing worth. And so when you're worshiping God, you're declaring that he's, of all things on planet Earth or in the universe, is worthy of our attention. I think of as a young kid, there was a guy named Arnie Dodge and I grew up with. We played baseball together. He was our shortstop. He was a tremendous baseball player. His mom bought him a beautiful car. And all the girls wanted to date Arnie. And I would look at Arnie and go, man, I'm so jealous. Wish I had a car. But Arnie was every day, was out there washing it, vacuuming it out, changing, you know, p- picking the hood up, changing the oil, taking care of it. And we, what would we say of Arnie? He worships that car. Or you've ever seen a person, an individual who is, um, just loves their spouse. And we'll say of him, oh, He worships the ground she walks on. He values her. He ascribes worth to her. And so he invests time and and money and uh, energy in his relationship with his spouse. Worship is to ascribe worth. And when we do that with God, we're ascribing worth to God as we express our worship to him. Now, we normally consider that to be singing, don't we? We uh, come before his presence with singing, the psalmist says in Psalm 100, verse 2. Sing to the Lord a new song, the psalmist says. We normally ascribe singing as an act of worship. We actually call the, the sanctuary, some churches call their sanctuary the worship center. Instead of calling it a church or a sanctuary, they call it the worship center. But there's lots of ways to worship. For example, we worship through prayer. Because we're acknowledging that God is the only one who is of value that can answer our prayers. We worship God through our tithes and offering. It's an act of worship to take part of the funds that he gives to us to give back to him. That's an act of worship. We worship God as we read his word and, and as we obey. Radical obedience, beloved, is actually an act of radical worship. And David did not care what his wife said, Michael, about his act of worship. He said, I'll do even more. I'll go even more over the edge when it comes to my worship of who God is. God wants us to be worshipers. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here. There are some people here this morning that predominantly want hymns as a part of their songs experience. I like hymns so to speak. I love the hymns, by the way. And then there's other people, oh, the hymns, I I can't stand them. 
I want more contemporary music. And so we have these worship wars sometimes based on the kind of music that's in, in, a, in a church. Help me here. Is Jesus worthy of our worship in spite of our preferences? In other words, if my preference is hymns, and we're singing that song, King of Kings, which I love, by the way. It's great in Spanish, too, Rey de Reyes. And they're singing this song, can I move beyond my preferences to ascribe worth to God, even though the song isn't one of my favorites? I like all kinds of music. There, I mean, there's some kinds of music that, you know, stretch me a little bit too far. <clears throat> rap being, you know, I'm not a big rap fan. I like, I like uh, heavy metal, but I don't, I'm not a big fan of rap. There's some rap that I really enjoy. Um, country music, bluegrass. But, uh, aw. <laughs> But those are, those are our preferences, right? Are there some people here, who here this morning just likes cheese pizza? That's the only kind of pizza you eat, cheese pizza, yeah. Some people here like pepperoni. I love pepperoni. There's other people here, that their preference is maybe a vegetarian pizza. Yeah, Pastor Stephen said that, no. <laughs> I'm a meat lover's kind of guy. Then there's people here who have the mark of the beast who put pineapple on their pepperoni. <laughs> That's just wrong. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but beloved, those are all preferences. And we're that way about worship. We get so locked into this song that it's not my favorite. We should, we should be able to worship Jesus Christ when things are good or things are bad in our lives. Amen? We should be able to worship Jesus Christ whether it's a song that we really like or it's a song that we don't really like. I've been in different worship contexts. I've been in Central Europe, in Slavic countries. They're very reserved, extremely reserved. As a matter of fact, they sit during the song service. They stand for the last song, and they rarely show any emotion. Their lips barely move as they sing the song. And I know that we're in the spirit when I'm in those congregations, when they raise their hands like this. They're off the hook. They're, you know, I'm used to people, you know, their hands are waving. Christina in the back of the sanctuary during worship, and she's dancing and, and her hands going. She's loving on Christ. I've been in, you know, churches in, in, in Central Europe. I've been in churches in South America. In Latino churches, they are off the hook. There's all kinds of activity going on. And it's not my preference, but it's a place where I can worship Jesus Christ. Because, you know, the music's extremely loud, and there's a lot of movement, but I know these brothers and sisters love Jesus Christ. And I can enter into worship in spite of its, you know, make, may make me a little uncomfortable. God wants us to be radical worshipers of Christ. We can worship him like David. But through radical obedience and just love for Jesus Christ. David was radical for, for God in the way he obeyed and the way he worshiped. And that's what I want for us, beloved. You know, this morning as we, we closed that song, we, we just clapped. That's kind of unusual for churches in the Northeast because we tend to be the frozen chosen, right? <laughs> but, you know, to, I'm, I'm, I'm in fascinated when I'm in Latino churches. Whenever there's, they talk about the resurrection, they just start clapping because that resurrection, they applaud not for the, the worship team, but, but the, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. That God is, Christ is raised from the dead, and we can rejoice in the victory that we have in Christ. David had radical obedience and radical worship, and that's what I want for us. Not to be a fool, but to be radical like Jesus was. Would you stand with me? Let's close in prayer. Pray with me. Father, we stand before you this morning as people who want to a deeper measure of faith in Christ. Lord, help us in this, this next week, in one area, in one aspect, in one thing in our life, to go deeper with Jesus Christ. Prepare us, O oh Lord, for a deeper walk with the Savior, that we might obey 
your word, be doers of your word, not hearers only. And that we might be worshipers. That we might commit ourselves, like Paul said, to the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our spiritual act of worship. Not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by your power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. but it's been great to be with you. I want to challenge you to express yourself more for the Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist says, I want to raise my hands like the evening sacrifice. It's a sign of submission to Christ, a submission to God. He says, let my prayer be unto you as incense. You know, and those activities in the temple, in the tabernacle. I want to encourage you to express yourself more in your worship to God. It's been great to be with you. Receive a blessing from Christ based upon the word of Christ. May, may the God of hope bless you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you might abound in hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.